All across America and around the world, this is Veterans Radio. This is Veterans Radio. And now, your host for today's program, Dale Throneberry. And welcome to Veterans Radio. My name is Dale Throneberry, but I'm really not going to be the host today. The host of today's program is our good friend and contributor, Eric Fretz. Dr. Fretz is a faculty lecturer at the University of Michigan, and he's going to be talking about the future of veteran studies on today's program. But before we get into that, I want to thank everybody for tuning in today, and we want to make sure that we let you know about our sponsors. And those include, of course, Legal Help for Veterans, and they specialize in veteran disability claims. So call Legal Help for Veterans at 800-693-4800. The National Veterans Business Development Council, better known as NVBDC, the nation's leading third-party authority for certification of veteran-owned businesses. For more information, you can go to their website, nvbdc.org. The Charles S. Kettles VA Medical Center in Ann Arbor, Michigan. For more information about that, the medical center here, you can go to va.gov slash Ann Arbor Healthcare. To learn more about these organizations and their services, as well as how you can support Veterans Radio, go to our website. That's veteransradio.net slash our sponsors. All right, so let's get right into the program here that uh, Eric has put together this week. As I mentioned, he's talking about uh, the future of veteran studies, and let me give you a little quick little background on Eric. He is, as I mentioned, a faculty lecturer at the University of Michigan, uh, discusses today uh, the degree programs in veteran studies. He retired from the United States Navy after 20 years. He draws extensively on his experiences in leadership and team dynamics to frame discussions of individual characteristics and differences and how to build and sustain teams that perform at a high level. He had three deployments in the Persian Gulf combat zone from Gulf War I in the early 90s to Baghdad in 2008, when he was assigned to the Army's 18th Airborne Corps. And he provided a rich source of lessons and stories about teamwork, management, and leadership. We're very honored to have Dr. Fretz as our uh, guest host today, and so we're going to go right into his interview right now. Good afternoon, everybody. This is your host, Dr. Eric Fretz, coming to you from Michigan, and we're going to continue our discussions of the veteran studies from our earlier episode, and we talked in our earlier episode about all these wonderful programs that have uh, come up all across the United States at different colleges and universities for both certificates, minors, and majors in veteran studies and veteran services. And so I've been able to gather some luminary lights in the field today, and I'm joined by a number of distinguished scholars who um, are here to talk about their programs. Um, So we have uh, Bruce Pensek, who's going to join us for just sort of generic commentary. We also have Travis Martin um, from the uh, Kentucky Center for Veteran Studies. And um, we've got Jim Craig from the University of Missouri-St. Louis and uh, Luke McLeese, um, who is from St. Leo. And he's going to talk to us about uh, their new program, which is actually a major. And I believe that's the first one of its kind. Um, So let's uh, let's go ahead and start. Travis, we've uh, chatted a little bit with you already. Um, Could you tell us a little bit about your program? I know that you, I think, started with a certificate. Um, You were, I think, maybe the first, one of the first, the first in the country. You have a certificate and a minor um, in veteran studies. You do internships and capstones and some cool stuff. Can you tell us a little about your program, how it evolved, and uh, kind of let people know how they could apply and whatnot. Sure. My uh, name is Travis Martin, Eastern Kentucky University, where uh, the Kentucky Center for Veteran Studies is housed. Uh, my background is in uh, 20th century American war literature and social theory. And uh, I started our program. Our first meetings were in September of 2010, and our first classes were taught in uh, 2011. Uh, our program is uh, based around this concept that we've I think it's discussed in another interview, interdisciplinarity. So I'll give you an example. Our introductory course has probably 10 different professors, uh, you know, lecturing online for the online component from every field from history to geography, to psychology, to social work, to uh, gender and cultural studies, to literature. So the idea that, you know, I try to tell students in, in our very service oriented program is that we're building kind of an interdisciplinary toolbox that I want them to be able to look at, you know, a, a veteran or a veteran's issue and be able to draw upon, you know, not only the skills of their own major, but to be adaptable 
this whole idea of a liberal education that's going to make you uh, ready to apply problems and worldview as a whole to, the sol- to find solutions in your workplace, not to be rigid, but to rather be flexible. So that's kind of the, the same kind of underlying philosophy of our program. So you'll find within our curriculum for our 18-hour minor or our 24-hour university level certificate courses from a lot of different fields, including psychology and social work and criminal justice even. And we'll do program approved electives. And we try to we we try to do things that will basically supplement the student's major by allowing them to kind of focus in on veterans and learn how to apply what they learn in their major to veterans issues. So if it's a police officer, how might you work with a veteran you meet on the street and you're trying to help them with their problem or figure out what their problem is? Are you going to come in there with um, stereotypes and misconceptions about the veteran community? Are you going to come in there with solutions about, you know, resources for veterans and also the things they've been through to better work with them through what's going on? Same thing with nurses, same things with social workers and psychology. So that's kind of the underlying kind of philosophy of what we're trying to do. And so we have been offering this for about a decade now, and it's grown to the point where, you know, I think higher education as a whole is moving in this direction of jobs, focus, skills, uh, what we call them here more recently, essential employability qualities, these transferable skills that you can get from your coursework. And so I kind of rebranded our program as the Kentucky Center for Veteran Studies to really hone in on internships, uh, cooperative learning experiences, uh, service learning in the community. And to give our students a chance to kind of take the lead to develop, you know, these opportunities that would improve the lives of veterans in our service region, while also helping them gain tangible skills that they could talk about in interview. You know, that's, uh, that's our program and that's the philosophy. I mean, I think this, the slogan is that veteran identities are non-monolithic and intersectional and our, our field is uh, interdisciplinary as a result. Nice. Yeah, definitely. We're going to get to that interdisciplinary stuff later for sure. So how many folks would you say you have invo- um, enrolled at the different levels now in the program? Sure. So our, our introductory to veteran studies course is the first course in the program. It's uh, found housed in our uh, general ed- general education six course for diversity. So it's a pretty popular course. I would say uh, we put anywhere from we have. A, OK, I'll tell you right now, we have 179 students in our online section and probably about 125 in our in-person just for that course. Nice. We, we have our new veterans and society course, uh, BTS 300, which is the uh, you have to have BTS 200 as a prerequisite. Uh, I'd say about 25 or 30 are in that course. And then we have, you know, right now 12 capstone students and three or four interns and things like that going on. And the program as a whole, I'd say we have about 60 credential seeking students. Nice. Okay. That sounds great. Thanks very much, Travis. Okay, next up, we're going to talk to uh, Dr. Jim Craig. He's the Associate Dean of College of Arts and Sciences, the Chair of the Sociology Department, and the Coordinator of Veteran Studies Program at University of Missouri-St. Louis. Um, so they have a Veteran Studies Program that offers a minor, um, along with two others, I think, right? So it's associated with a, there's a, like a military history one, and there's an interdisciplinary option, and you have the same sort of internship and capstone features, so some things that are sort of similar to what Travis is doing. Um, could you talk a little bit more about your program, how it started, kind of where it's at now, Who's your ideal yeah. student? Stuff like that. yeah. So, uh, quick correction, just to start. No, no doctor, uh, no PhD. Um, ah, okay. <laughs> which is saying, which is odd. Have, you on still a, have a lot of very nice titles. So I got a bunch of titles, but it's odd on a you know research university. But here I am, uh, and my background is public administration, actually, uh, the military and public administration. So uh, when I got here to the University of Missouri St. Louis, I actually first started working on student veteran transition issues. And within about a semester, I realized that the student veterans themselves and then the students around the student veterans hadn't really thought deeply about their experiences or why they thought the things they thought about veterans or about themselves or their experiences. And so I went to the dean and asked the dean if I could teach a class and thinking I would get uh, you know, a class and then just kind of teach myself in the process. And it ended up turning into this program. Uh, the basis of our program is Travis's work. So uh, the work at EKU really is the the foundation that I built our program on. Awesome. And then in addition, I took a little bit of work from Alexis Hart and Roger Thompson, who did a bunch of uh, fantastic work on writing programs for veterans and how they reflect on themselves. Mm-hmm. And I kind of put those two together and we ended up with what we have at our campus, which is a minor right now in veteran studies. Uh, We started out with an actual department. And the reason we started with a department is because there used to be an ROTC camp on our campus. And uh, uh, in the drawdown in the 90s, it was archived. But the the dean was smart enough to know, well, it's archived, but not gone. And we just changed the name. And that gave a bunch of authorities to me as the chair of this department to uh, start to build a program. 
that department doesn't exist again. It's been archived again, but uh, that allowed us to build. And, and you know, there's some lessons. It's really the infrastructure of a university and understanding that is really important if you want to build a program. Mm -hmm. So my program is uh, interdisciplinary as well, and it starts with an introductory course, uh, Introduction to Veteran Studies or Veterans in American Society, which has been called for the last three years uh, since I moved into the sociology department. And it is very similar. It talks about you know, enabling veteran students to reflect more deeply on their service, but also helping non-veteran students reflect more deeply on how America thinks of its veterans. The goal there as a minor is to be kind of a, a foundation. And then you go back to your major, whether it's psychology or social work or English or computer science, and those intersections between your work in that discipline and the veteran world, will you will be able to find those intersections and you'll, you'll be able to reflect more deeply on them. And then you come back to us at the end for a capstone exercise, which asks you to build something new or thoughtful or valuable, whether it's a you know a piece of creative work. We have actually had somebody who did a dance. Uh, like we've had people who, who wrote major research projects. We've had people who did posters. We've, uh, we've had a bunch of really interesting ways to do this. And then you go back out to the world and you have been informed in a minor form not in a major disciplinary form, about the veteran and the veteran experience, and you join society smarter and more intelligent about that and able to reflect. Sure. Um, yeah, that's, so that's how we goes, And we have uh, our numbers are not like Travis's. Boy, that's those numbers are fantastic. I wish we were a gen ed course. We are not a gen ed course. And I'm sure you recruit from the gen ed pool into the next level. We, we At this stage, we don't have that. And that's the structures of the university and what cultural – means to this university. Uh, I'm still working on that. So our numbers are small. We're in the handfuls. I have probably seven or eight minors right now. I usually pick up two or three with every new school year, and then I graduate two or three on the other end. Okay. And I would say half, half veterans and non-veterans. So that's kind of where we stand when you're at a university that you know pays by the credit hour and minors are uh, kind of a weird thing. It'll <laughs> get you towards the degree that you need to get you out the door. So you really have to recruit yes, and work. Yes. Um, and that's the vet center helps with that too. So okay. No, hopefully that's, that's helpful. That is good. Sounds like a, uh, a great program. All right. And um, next up, we will talk to Dr. Luke McLeese, the director and office uh, office of military affairs and services at St. Leo university. And the nice thing here is that uh, I believe you started with the minor, but now have actually kicked off a 39 hour uh, major and starting the, uh, this term, basically, um, this will be the first major in veteran studies in the United States, I believe. Is that correct? That is correct. We will we will be the first major. However, we just started out as a major. And okay. we, we do offer a minor. But um, this course was, we're, we're so young. This was just approved uh, late spring, Exciting. really. Yeah. So uh, our last kind of level of approval went through and we went from that to being able to launch this fall. So it's, it's been a, a whirlwind. I'm surprised we were able to get a hold of you. You think you're going to be a pretty busy guy right now. <laughs> uh, obnoxiously, but you know, similar to Travis and to Jim, um, our program really is a program that looks at the identity of the veteran and at the implications of service, you know, what are the positives? What are the negatives? What does it mean? for an individual? What does it mean for society? What does it mean when those entities intermingle and intermesh? Um, so we are housed like the others. We, we are interdisciplinary in nature, and we are actually housed in the Department of Interdisciplinary Studies. Um, we have you know, core courses, we have 200 level, 300 level, 400 level courses that someone in the major would take, uh, as well as those interdisciplinary things they can pick from that range from history to psychology to philosophy to global studies, religion, and things of this nature to, to really answer those questions about people in the profession, how they're shaped by military service, what it's like to, to be involved in something that society might see as kind of a, a semi-morally compromised position and job and, you know, all the, all the in-betweens there. So what would you say um, in terms of the um, the program itself, like how uh, are you seeing a lot of folks enrolling? Do you have a particular goal that you're shooting for in terms of numbers of people? 
our goal this year was just to start, right? And so far, all of our classes have made, and we even have uh, we even have students who are on their way out of St. Leo that are graduating with their bachelors and still wanted to take something. So we are even you know filling in some of the four hundred level like one on one. Uh, studies courses where we're going to kind of do an internship and a special project for someone just because they were so hungry for it. The <clears throat> demand was to get a taste, nice. uh, even if they were majoring in something else and, and, and out the door. So a uh, big response are the thing, the one thing that's holding us back this uh, year is we are starting on on campus only. And I will say, much like the the numbers Travis was talking about, uh, all of the response, not all, but a great deal of the response has been people asking for online programs. And uh, if it wasn't for geography, we would be past max capacity. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But uh, the geography uh, is holding us back a little. However, we're still... We're still in a good position. And you're down there in St. Leo, Florida. What what uh, what big city that folks would recognize is that closest to? So we're north of Tampa. Got it's it. about a half hour north of Tampa okay. and in a different county. So it's a different feel up there. It's it's a uh, it's more rural, more laid back, I would say, more akin to like what Travis's setting is. However, we're a half hour away from Tampa and 45 nice. minutes or so from the beaches, if mm-hmm. anybody's listening and considering. There you go. I'd have a good life as a student. All right. Um, and there are a couple of other programs that I know we had touched on briefly earlier, and we were just chatting before the program. I'd like to talk just a little bit about uh, Anita uh, Bradford can't be with us um, from the um, University of California, Irvine, but now they have um, at the UCI School of Social Sciences, they kicked off in 2019, uh, this Veteran Studies Certificate. So they do these sort of nine credits, these three courses in history, Veterans Voices and Veterans Transitions. Um, I know that's a very nice program. Um, if you have any familiar with that, you want to talk a little bit, does anybody have any comments they'd like to make about that? I wanted to make sure that we sort of talk about all these other cool programs that are out there as well. I know for a fact that I believe they're offering that certificate entirely online now. Okay. So anyone can get that if they want to. Uh, they're great people. I've enjoyed talking yeah. to them. I, I'm hundred percent behind you on that. And I, I would say the, the lesson, at least at the stage now where veteran studies is, is it's still a small enough pool that everybody generally knows each other and we're building on each other's work, which is how mm-hmm. these things should happen. Uh, I don't think it's going to be long now before mm-hmm. there's more than we can keep track of. Sure. But uh, right now you talk to ASU, you talk to UC Irvine, you talk to St. Leo, you talk to EKU or us. Uh, we're all working together on this on this endeavor. Sure, sure, sure. So you brought up ASU, so that would be uh, Manuel Aviles Santiago, right? He's uh, running that program. It's uh, mentioned that's a Veterans in Society certificate. Again, I'm totally willing to yield the floor to anybody who thinks they could maybe talk a little bit about it. Uh, I think uh, they're very similar, right? So they ha- you have to build your certificate or your minor around what the what works at your university. And ASU uh, has been uh, moving very strongly into online components, as well as lots and lots of interdisciplinarity and building departments and programs that overlap. And, you know, and so you know, I think they did a similar thing. In fact, I went down there uh, several years ago to help them when they were designing it as did Jim Dubinsky from Virginia Tech and mm-hmm. um, and worked with them on their ideas and then what worked at our campuses or not, didn't work at our, it, it's fantastic. It's If it's available and it works for you, I would say take it mm-hmm. and, um, because they're great professors teaching and great students taking it. Yeah. We also mentioned that there's some other programs that sometimes are focused on more of a graduate level and a more practical applied things. So for example, SUNY Empire State, where they have an advanced certificate in veteran services, which I think we were talking about seems to be geared toward preparing people to go right into, say, jobs with the Veterans Administration in terms of offering uh, help to veterans as they seek benefits and stuff. So that would be another another angle on this that's a little different. And so um, I know, Bruce, you've, uh, you've just been sort of uh, sitting on the sidelines there. Appreciate that. And I know you and I had mentioned a couple of things that you had talked a little bit about uh, some some uh, some interesting work that some librarians were doing uh, around um, sort of working with veterans. And I wondered if you just wanted to throw a comment in there about that. Public librarians especially are – deeply involved with all members of their community. So there is a group within the American Library Association 
which is trying to figure out what kinds of services are public librarians offering. And again, many public libraries are not just simply places with books, but community centers. They may host all kinds of community events, uh, workshops, continuing education kinds of projects. So this Veterans Caucus, which is headed by a uh, an academic librarian who is a veteran, she is at, at uh, Texas A&M, is right now they're working on an inventory of who's doing what. Some, uh, some California public libraries are very active in programming for veterans in their communities. Mm-hmm. And I, I want to emphasize that because the leaders to this or listeners to this program are not simply academics like us talking at them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and they, they should look to see and, and be involved many times as well. Projects that are funded, say, by the National Endowment for the Humanities, such as their dialogues of the experience of war grants, of which our colleague Eric Hodges will be leading one at Longwood University in, I guess it'll actually run next year. He's doing the preparatory work this year. There are opportunities for things like reading groups of veterans to get together and talk about certain important texts that can interact with their experiences. Okay. On the academic side, folks like me, of course, are trying to identify what sorts of resources are there, not only to support programs in being, but to try to anticipate where there might be directions uh, for research as well as undergraduate education. And one thing I'm particularly prone to speculate about is what would graduate education in veteran studies look like. Virginia Tech has a a big presence in the Washington, D.C. area, and there are many career military, particularly officers up there who are passing through our programs, getting graduate credentials, and I think leveraging their experiences, which as as know-nothing civilian in this group, I tend to think are significantly different from the experiences of, of enlisted personnel, particularly ones who've only done you know, one or two tours, and trying to leverage their mm-hmm. knowledge as well as to, to give an opportunity for them to exercise their, their graduate education programs. Mm-hmm. Well, this idea of kind of where to next is what we're going to be talking about in the second half of our program. So um, we're going to go ahead and take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit more about these programs and common things that we see that might uh, affect them and where they might be going in the future. So we'll talk to you soon, folks. Be right back. The Medal of Honor is the highest award for valor in combat given a member of the Armed Forces of the United States. There have been over 3,400 recipients of the nation's highest award. This is one of them. Chaplain Joseph O'Callaghan administered to the wounded and dying, led firefighting crews, and directed the jettisoning of live ammunition from his stricken ship. Details after this. If you have a VA claim denied by the Board of Veterans Appeals, contact Legal Help for Veterans at 1-800-693-4800. They're experts in handling cases before the U.S. Court of Appeals for Veterans Claims. Their number again, 1-800-693-4800. Why do I serve in the U.S. Navy? For freedom. Freedom of religion. What America stands for. Why do I serve in the U.S. Navy? For honor. Everybody. And watch out for everybody. Freedom to vote. Democracy. Freedom to go outside and play with my kids. I joined the Navy to serve my country. Every freedom that we have. The right to raise our kids in peace. My little brother. My wife. My kids. Our children's children. The United States Navy. It's not for ourselves alone that we serve. O'Callaghan was serving as chaplain on board the USS Franklin when that vessel was fiercely attacked by enemy Japanese aircraft. Calmly braving the barriers of fire and twisted metal to aid his men and his ship, O'Callaghan groped his way through smoke-filled quarters to the open flight deck and into the midst of violently exploding bombs, shells, rockets, and other armament. With the ship rocked by incessant explosions, with debris and fragments raining down and fires raging in ever-increasing fury, he ministered to the wounded and dying, comforting and encouraging men of all faiths. He organized and led firefighting crews into the blazing inferno on the flight deck. He directed the jettisoning of live ammunition and the flooding of the magazine. 
He manned a hose to cool hot armed bombs rolling dangerously on the listing deck. Continuing his efforts despite searing, suffocating smoke which forced men to fall back gasping. O'Callaghan inspired the officers and men of the Franklin to fight heroically and with profound faith in the face of almost certain death and to return their stricken ship to port. The Medal of Honor series is a production of Veterans Radio. Military veterans touch everyone's life. I'm guessing right now you're thinking of a veteran, a close friend, relative, maybe it's you. Even the toughest of us sometimes need help, but don't know where to turn for support. You don't need special training to help a veteran in your life. We can all help someone going through a difficult time. Learn how you can be there for veterans. Visit VeteransCrisisLine.net. VeteransCrisisLine.net. A message from the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. Okay, let's make sure that you stick around for the second half of our program today. That's Dr. Eric Fretz talking about the future of veteran studies. And uh, we'll be back after his interview is completed to kind of wrap up today's program. So here we go. Back to Eric. Welcome back, everybody. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Fretz, and we're here for the second half of our program um, with our friends uh, Luke McLeese, Bruce Pensek, Jim Craig, and Travis Martin. And we're talking about the various programs in veteran studies that are available here in the U.S. So we've had a nice review of all the different programs and features that they offer. Um, and one of the things I'd like to talk about next, and we can just kind of sort of have an open round the table discussion, is that these programs are all really featuring you know interdisciplinarity but not in a monolithic way. So uh, you'll see that they draw on either implicitly or explicitly courses in history, religion, psychology, philosophy, international global relations, social work or social science, and then sometimes a dedicated veteran studies conduit or curriculum that, that you know will all blend together. And in some cases, only a few of those things are actually offered within the veteran studies bubble and everything else is just sort of from the larger university offerings, or in other cases, it's sort of a custom curated collection. So I'd like to talk a little bit about that, how in each of your cases you selected the curriculum and got it approved to the degree that you're creating a bunch of new courses um, you know how difficult was that what sort of support did you need from your administration you know are there any sort of funding issues um, just uh, in general this sort of idea of um, you know, how the programs came about and where they're going to go so uh, who anybody would like to go first just kind of so this is, you're going to find some very common uh, things occurring at each of our schools. And I just want to go ahead and do a plug to start that uh, Luke and Jim and uh, Anita Bradford, Nancy, I'd like, we're all trying to get these people who started these programs together under this group. We're going to call it the National Center for Excellence in Veteran Studies. Nice. It'll be a very informal group to basically mentor people who want to start programs at their school to get through these curricular and political issues that are going to occur as they try to, to navigate all of that. Excellent. So, Thinking back to whenever I did this, I, I, I was a master's student, a former army sergeant who was teaching his first semester of college. So I knew nothing about how to design curriculum, uh, what kinds of courses would go into a, uh, you know, any sort of credential. And I was trying to get basically people to take me seriously. And I noticed that in, in our last talk that, you know, other schools are having trouble convincing uh, people in their general education programs that veteran identity is a form of diversity. Uh, that was something that we targeted heavily. The EKU at the time was recognized as one of the top schools for vets in the country, and still is. And um, we were saying, look, if you're going to, you know, claim this this uh, this, this veterans services superiority, you need you need to back it up in your curriculum. And you'll hear these same kinds of arguments with, like, when you hear uh, discussions about anti-racist pedagogy, like people not being included in the curriculum, for example, of people of color. Um, you know, how the buildings on campuses are all named after old dead white people, stuff like that. So veterans aren't really included in the curriculum with the exception of historical accounts of war or, you know, things like that. We don't get a lot of coverage of like the bonus march or things like um, the stuff that goes on in the VA hospital and the fights for benefits. So this is a form of diversity and that should be one of the first places that, you know, a lot of us are going to find ourselves struggling. And the second is that a lot of these programs are emerging, emerging from uh, veteran services uh, entities within their schools. I think everyone here's program emerged from their, one of those programs. And Luke and Jim, I believe you still run your programs, if I'm not mistaken. Ours has moved to the Department of Psychology. UC Irvins, I believe, is in sociology. Um, they end up maybe in different places, but it tends to be the work of veterans who are compassionate and who actually care about the issues who do it for free, probably for a number of years before they actually get institutional support. 
And so that's the kind of reality we're up against right now. We're in an age of higher education where funding is drying up on the national and state levels. And if you want to start something new, you're basically going to have to be able to justify it through enrollment numbers. So that's the kind of stuff that I hope that we can help with this small group we hope to start next year uh, with helping mentor new schools. Yeah, that sounds like a fantastic idea and very much in keeping with that kind of military idea of like, don't reinvent the wheel, right? So, you know, the thing, you know, I always remember, I think I still use this term, but, you know, when we were in schools back in the 80s in the military, people were like, you know, what's the gouge? And I mean, and sometimes people meant that cheating, but not always. Usually what they meant was, what's the information, what's the 10% of this that I absolutely have to completely master? And what's the 5% that's going to blow up in my face? And prioritize, you know, get the other 85% too. But get the scoop of what the most important stuff is, and, and, and that's that sounds awesome. Yeah, well, that's great. I hope Luke, we should yeah. luck with that. Yep. If I can follow up a little bit on that, and maybe this will spark some discussion also. So it's as much about helping others build those programs, what a, a veteran studies, and inter, really an interdisciplinary veteran studies program. That's really critically important. But there's also some importance about trying to figure out what not is a veteran studies program as well, because that is a the veteran itself. The, the term is a bumper sticker that can be used for all sorts of purposes. Mm-hmm. This is like, this is what we study, right? So in, in my mind, uh, a trauma studies program is very important and veterans uh, understanding how veterans or the veteran experience or combat experience uh, fits into a trauma studies program is really important, but that's not necessarily a veteran studies program. Uh, and so this organization that we're thinking about is, I hope will help define the field a little bit more and, mm-hmm. and it's tough in an interdisciplinary. So we don't want, we don't want to put too hard of guardrails or uh, too small a tent. It is a big tent, but yeah. um, a discipline needs to have some disciplinarity to it Absolutely. Um, some way. And so this is part of the stuff we're struggling with, mm-hmm. you know, to be fair, uh, you know, I'm in a room with P- in a zoom room here with PhDs. I'm, I'm not a classically trained uh, academic, mm-hmm. uh, so I need that those guardrails as well, or I'll just go off the reservation sure. and start. Well, if I may, policy, may actually I take like public policy. Sure, I'll take a moment to actually sort of quote back to you from something I thought that you published, and I just love this quote where you defined it. You said you offered this sort of initial definition. You said veteran studies is an emerging, inherently multidisciplinary academic field devoted to developing a clearer understanding of veterans and the veteran experience in the past, the present, and the future. And I mean, that's a great start, you know. I mean, you, you may, you may not have the credential, but you seem to have the skill set. So, you know, I think it's, I think that's going great. And that's definitely the direction we need to go. Mm -hmm. So there was others. And, and, um, we, we didn't mention, I think Utah, they used to have one that was really focused around trauma, but I think they've transitioned that into being a veteran studies, uh, identity, more, more understanding identity program. And they're working hard in that direction. Um, have a couple of conversations with them as well. So they're, they're out there working on this too. You know, Eric, and I'll I'll add the piece that you referenced by Jim. I know it's something that when students come to Veteran Studies 201, my intro course, it's a piece that they read day one. I know it's the same for Travis. You know, I know they read that there as well. And here's here's the deal. I think the future of the, the immediate future of Veteran Studies is to do exactly what we're doing here, and that's to grow the programs out and give us volume among institutions, right? Because there is an interest there, but like Jim said, sometimes it's that bumper sticker type thing and and people are are looking at it as a way to exploit veteran to uh, bring their numbers up. So when we introduce these programs, I know this has been an issue for me and I know it's been an issue for the others that you've got to explain exactly the purpose behind veteran studies from the get-go because so many people will see it as two things that it typically is not you know they'll see it as this nationalistic flag waving thing or they'll see it as this oh woe is me about everything right and veteran studies is neither one of those (laughs) so i think setting that stage for the world to understand and then growing these programs out uh so people can start understanding just like they understand what gender studies are, mm-hmm. you know, uh, what the, the African-American experience is like, what well, all these things that we, it's, it's this time. Cause like Travis said, uh, a lot of people aren't discussing uh, veterans as a minority. And mm-hmm. when you look at the numbers, uh, you can't, 
you can't reject this at, at all. Yeah, they very much are. And that lack of awareness, I think, is tough. I mean, it ties in with this idea that we, you know, it's it's with no draft. We know we've gone now two, three generations with no draft. And that means that we've got this smaller and smaller group. And we all know the numbers and the dropping under the 1% of folks that are actually carrying the burden of combat and service. And so it's tough. And we're getting to the point where, you know, being being a veteran and running for Congress is sort of seen as a novelty. When when I was young, I think seventy two percent of the people in Congress had had service in their background when I was young. Uh, you know, and it's just not that way anymore. Um, so interesting to follow up on a comment you made. So would would you all agree that maybe is it safe to say, or would you endorse uh, this if I said you're you would like to see a certificate or minor program be relatively common to join the, join the sort of the academic pantheon of, of all these other sort of minors and whatever studies and, and have, have it be sort of relatively the norm to have something like this at most institutions that would be so, a good goal. You know, gender, gender studies did not start until the 1970s and they're ubiquitous. Now you would be hard pressed to find a campus that did not have that. Mm-hmm. I fully believe within a few decades, if we get our, we keep working together the way we have, we don't become, you know, a silo. We don't fight against each other over our institutional territories and stuff like that. We keep having this kind of, quite frankly, veteran looks out for veteran mentality, or at least people, you know, compassionate about the veteran community looking out for each other mentality, that we can grow this to something pretty substantial. I want to point out something Luke said, if I could just take a second, that the misconceptions that people have, it's either a flag waving patriotic thing, or it's uh, something that is about fixing the veteran. And that leaves the civilian entirely out of the equation. So when people, civilians primarily are looking at our programs, they're not even thinking about themselves and what they might need to learn. And that's really the problem that we're trying to solve here, isn't it? It's that we tell our veterans that they need to go off into lounges and safe spaces and therapy offices and fix themselves. And we never think about fixing the world that they return to. And that's the promise of veteran studies to actually educate people about what veterans have been through, about their identities and their cultures and their experiences to make our Coming at it from coming at it from both sides, yeah, yeah, you got to. Very good. So, in terms of you know the the arc that you've all each of you have been down as you've grown your programs, um, you know, what would you say some of the big challenges we talked about? You're going to create this um, group that sort of provide these supports, right? What would you say, and just in general, for the folks who are maybe some folks that are listening, thinking about it, or just in general terms, you know, what are some of the major stumbling blocks um, that you faced, and then uh, and how hard was it to sort of get all the curriculum pieces lined up? So um, this is Jim, I'll open uh, with a, a couple of observations before I go into the curriculum stuff. First of all, it, you know, when we, we kind of compare ourselves to the trends, to the growth of gender studies or ethnic studies, uh, often those things were agitated and advocated for on campuses by students who have those experiences, at, at least at my campus. And I think in many others, in our society right now, veterans aren't agitating to study their experiences more deeply mm-hmm. uh, because someone's already told them what their experiences are. Now, that's no different than gender or ethnic in the past either. So we need to help them understand that they can think like that. And maybe the agitation will come, mm-hmm. hopefully. But uh, I'm not seeing a clamoring on my campus to build more veterans courses, even though we're, you know, we're a four or five percent veterans on this campus, which is larger than most. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's high. Um, uh, now given that, then you have to build in the current world. And I think both people, you have to build, uh, some sort of like direct connection to employability into your programs, um, and into the write-ups and the sell, the selling of your program on campus. Mm -hmm. I can't get something through my state for sure without telling them what the job they're going to get is. So, so, uh, in my case, interdisciplinary programs don't have a very specific job. What they have is a set of skills that you can bring and you can start to quantify those and identify those. And I would say, if you're thinking about building those programs, start early, Uh, maybe that's not the first thing you should think about, but don't, don't wait till the last to try to paste on what the job is later because it won't work. There's, okay. uh, there's opportunities there in thoughtful, engaged uh, people who can do research, people who can think deeply, people who can imagine, manage projects in, in the veteran studies field. Good stuff. And if you happen to have a veterans health or a veterans benefit administration office in your nearby where you are, even better, right? Nat- check in with nat- them and see what they, check in with them and see what they need. That's a natural and Use flow. their own, yeah. 
So what do you think, Travis or Luke? Do there's uh, any lessons learned that you uh, think about when you were working on your programs? You know, one thing, you know, I think that Jim's program and Luke's probably will emerge this way based on St. Leo's veteran population is that uh, veteran studies is valuable to veterans in terms of being able to contextualize their experiences. And the reason that veterans, you know, I'll say this as a veteran, probably are not clamoring for veteran studies is because they need to think more critically about their experiences. If they did, they would realize that they would see at what goes on in society, that when they get pulled up in front of a crowd and used as a political prop or whenever their identity gets harnessed to sell things on television or to make superficial character representations as a movie uh, plot device, they, they would start to recognize these sorts of things and like, hey, what the heck? You know, just because, you know, we're veterans doesn't mean that we're, we're all the same or that we feel this way or that way or the other. These, these are all things that veterans should be concerned about. And there are veterans like us and others that, you know, the, the 200 or so that came to that veteran studies conference, I'd say a good number of them were veterans. Uh, and a good 30% of the students who take my intro course online uh, are probably veterans and 15% in person. So veterans are starting to figure this out. As veteran studies grows, it will start to kind of light that fire. And who knows where we'll be in a decade or yeah, so. I totally agree. I totally agree. So we, we need to help. We have the pulpit to help with that, help people understand that you're allowed to do that. In fact, you mm-hmm. should do that if you want to become an educated person in our society. You should reflect on your experiences, wh- yeah. whatever they are. No, I, I was just going to say, I, I think, you know, building on what Travis and Jim have pointed out, I think, you know, from human nature, it's hard for us sometimes to conceptualize something that's abstract and not there. But when we have these programs to show people, then they can start clamoring for the programs because they'll say, oh, this exists. It's out there. Uh, What is this about? Or man, maybe this is going to put some labels to some, to some things I've been noticing in my own life or also for the, the civilian to say, okay, well, maybe this experience is more than a bumper sticker and a campaign slogan, and maybe I do need to understand this. So I think once these are created, and once these programs are created, people will come to them. I will say it, it, has, it was initially a hard sell for me uh, just to get people to understand, no, this doesn't have to do with uh, you know getting people enrolled in VA benefits, or no, this doesn't you know, that it was uniquely uh, an experiential, you know, study of people and, and something that uh, isn't really an arc of, of experiences in someone's life. So that initial thing was very hard sell. However, uh, what helped me is the chair of interdisciplinary studies. She is married to a former Marine. She has always studied art from the nexus of mm-hmm. kind of conflict and, and creation so she got that. And then I was able to reference everyone's great programs that are on this today. You know, I was able to say, well, look, here's what EKU has done from the get go. And I actually cut my teeth at that, you know, institution and in that program. Here's what Jim took and, and ran with. And here's how he made his own. Here's what the people at Virginia Tech are doing. Uh, you know, and I was able to use these as like, look, this might be unique, but it's not a unicorn. Mm-hmm. And, and people are out there doing it. Yeah. And I love that you, a bunch of you brought up the same concept of, you know, could if you build it, they will come. Because in the position I'm at at Michigan, you know, we don't have that, we don't have that sort of programming yet. And we have, of course, a number of colleges around and a number of professional schools. And I'm very heavily into the whole veteran scene in the county and even in the state. And so people just drift towards me. It's, oh, I heard about you. Or somebody, somebody sent me to you to, can you serve on my dissertation committee because I'm doing this thing about veterans? And I'm like, sure. Uh, and so I, it's sort of like I'm, you know, we're in space and there's all of these chunks of veteran stuff just over here in the social work belt. And there's a bunch of stuff over here in the psychology zone. And if we were to create some kind of a gravity well, some kind of a small start of a planet, right, that had enough of its own mass, and you'd start to pull just naturally sort of pull these things into orbit around it, because they are veteran studies things, they just don't have a planet to hang around. So they're just drifting over here in this other areas. And so I think that would... uh, that would end up, uh, I think, working pretty well. Um, so with that thought, then, I just want to kind of serve up my last sort of hypothetical question, which is, 
what indeed would say, you know, say we want to get Jim into a PhD program in veteran studies <laughs> and get that knocked out, right? <laughs> or have a, have a, have a, have a program. Have you been talking that. to my dean? <laughs> yeah. so there you go. So, you know, what do you think that would need to look like? Obviously it's a, it's a bit beyond, you know, you'd, you'd almost, you know, it really implies that there's a departmental structure at that point, I think, although maybe you guys think differently. Um, so I'm just curious as to kind of what you think, you know, if there was ever to be a PhD in veteran studies, um, kind of spitballing a little bit. What do you, what do you think about that? And what would it look like? It I actually, like go, inter- yeah, go ahead, Travis. Sorry. I think to me, it would look like interdisciplinary social theory just applied to veterans issues. I, I was going to say, I actually think a PhD is easier uh, than, uh, than a bachelor's degree uh, or a master's degree. A PhD, because, because of the nature of PhD programs, you can take them in a direction. As long as your, your committee allows you and your school allows you, you can take them in the direction you want. Sure. You might not have the name yet, but um, – uh, and I'm, we struggle. We are not uh, anywhere near at our campus uh, to a major discipline – uh, everyone on this call is watching what's going to happen at St. Leo because we're keeping our fingers crossed that it is. But the struggle sure, really, sure. in my case, is a major discipline uh, has structures. It has some theories that maybe not a theory, but it has theories mm-hmm. and it has methods and it has research. Yeah. And it takes a while to get yes. those things together. Yes. And I think um, so I would, you know, I, I am on a couple of dissertation committees for students now, one in social work one in nursing, one in political science, all essentially doing veteran studies. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if we could put them all in the same department after they graduate, then you'd have it. The, the bachelor's is tough. All right. Well, the pressure's all on you there, Luke. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I agree with, with Travis and Jim, you know, that it's most definitely has to shape up like this. And the research element, I agree with Jim there. I think, it, that's the easy part. Um, Bruce might know this number. I knew at one time because I had bad time management. I looked at, and I looked it up. But when you looked on um, ProCre- ProQuest, excuse me, for dissertations last year with the word veteran, I believe the number is somewhere around like 348 dissertations last year alone were written with the word veteran something in there. So, <laughs> you know, it, it's just a matter of getting the framework and getting those conceptual models to, to match what's being studied because sure. people, like you said, Eric, people are already doing it, mm-hmm. right. It's already being done. And if we take it in what I agree with Travis, that what should look like and keep and retain this interdisciplinary framework here. I mean, this, not only do I believe that this could happen, I believe that a PhD in, in veteran studies is in our future. I, without a doubt, I believe that. Nice. Yeah. Um, I, 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 thanks, Luke. I, I think your, your recollection sounds about right. I have not checked lately and I'm not going to do it during this, this conversation. Um, get back to me later. Um, but I think, you know, I think that the sense, you know, there's an, a kindred part in, in library land about, well, what is a core collection for this look like? Uh, as I've mentioned previously, I'm particularly interested in getting the non-U.S., non-living veterans part into these conversations, classics, literature, and not just in the Western canon, but I think the Western canon is unappreciated uh, as Western popular culture is unappreciated for how many veterans narratives may be there whether it's because people have not had the experience as serving in the military or their orientation is so presentist that they just don't recognize these things that were in the Mm -hmm. air a couple generations ago. And I think part of this is, you know, it, it's creating boundaries and then recognizing they have to be porous, which is probably a really bad thing to do in, in, (laughs) literally in the field from a military standpoint but is probably what what we need to be thinking about there are a lot of yes buts probably it's one way of saying a separation is probably except in the area of military humanity or excuse me aside from medical humanities we leave the clinical and therapeutic stuff out we don't talk like 
those researchers. We don't have the, the vocabulary really to crack their literature. Let's not try, but be open where they're the occasional conversations. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. so that I, I work in, in science and technology studies. I think those are good points, and I think we'll, we'll try to wrap it up there. So I think, yeah, this really brings it into focus, you know, this idea that the continued work of this group that you're talking about to help foster the programs, the ongoing work of the Journal of Veteran Studies that we talked about in an earlier program, the conference for the for the veteran studies, and then, of course, the growth of all these wonderful programs all coming together, I think, will help sort out, you know, what is the field, what are the definitions, what counts evidence, all that good stuff. So just plenty of work ahead, and uh, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I'd like to thank again uh, Travis yeah. Martin, Jim Craig. Craig, uh, Luke McLeese, and Bruce Pensick for joining me here today. And I hope you all have learned a lot here on this episode of Veterans Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Eric Fretz, and we'll see you next time on Veterans Radio. Wow. Thank you, Dr. Fretz. I hope everybody learned a lot about the veteran studies programs that are going out there. It's about time that these programs were instituted across the country. We're very excited to have uh, Dr. Fretz as one of our contributors. He's also on the board of Veterans Radio America, and we're looking forward to his uh, programming in the future. Um, right now, again, I want to make sure that we thank our sponsors. That, again, would be the uh, Legal Help for Veterans, the National Veterans Development Council, and the Charles S. Kettle VA Medical Center here in Ann Arbor. I want to make sure that you all stick around for our program next week. It's going to be our monthly benefits program. We kind of took a hiatus there for Thanksgiving and Christmas, but we will be back next week with our benefits program. So if you have any questions regarding uh, VA health care or disability benefits, uh, make sure you send us an email with your questions, and we will attempt to answer all of those on our program on next week. Now, I want to make sure that you follow us on Facebook. We need The more and more followers we have, the better off it is. If you know of any stations that you think would be interested in carrying Veterans Radio, let us know who they are, and we'll be, we will reach out and contact them. So as I said, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram. All, <laughs> every social platform is out there that we can think of. We want you to pay attention to that. Check out also our... Uh, a post exchange on our website, veteransradio.net, uh, to get some, you know, we have our little hats, shirts, cups, all kinds of things for you. So, uh, again, we encourage you to go to our website and explore around and find out more about all of the people that participate with Veterans Radio, um, our board members, and remember that you can support Veterans Radio as well because Veterans Radio is a production of Veterans Radio America, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. And I, I, again, as I said, I hope you enjoyed today's program. We're really excited to have Dr. Fretz on our staff as a contributor and as a board member. And I'm sure he will be coming back in the next couple of months with some more very interesting stories. We have a little bit of time left in today's program. So I thought I would play a song from one of our former programs. And this is an album of music that was written by Vietnam veterans. It's called uh, Welcome to the World. It's by a, a, a veteran named Par Thon. And it's from an album called The Last Thing We Ever Do, Warrior Songs, Volume Number 3. And so I'm, we're going to go out on this song today, and I, I, I think you'll find it very meaningful and very powerful. And again, the song is entitled Welcome to the World. And now, uh, until next week, this is Dale Throneberry, and you are dismissed. You know, I was raised with my mama and my daddy. My brothers and my sisters, and I was always mama's little boy. But on this day, I went to bed a boy and woke up a man. I woke up this morning in a far foreign land, left my lady crying.
arrived in Frisco. There was tension in the air, in the air. Leather coats and berets. My uniform I could not wear. I couldn't wear it. That's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah, oh, sorry. We were looking for Chumba Casino. That's right. Chumbacasino.com has over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Forward, prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.